Our next uh, presenter is Dr. Paul Bowyer. Uh, Dr. Bowyer has a background in organic and inorganic chemistry. He undertook a PhD in 92 at the University of New South Wales, part of which was completed at the University of Cambridge, followed by postdoctorates at ANU and the University of Basel, Switzerland. Paul started teaching wine chemistry and wine sensory analysis at Charles Sturt University in 99 and received a Teaching Excellence Award. In 2003, he moved to the University of Adelaide, and in 2006, he joined the commercial sector with Lafort Australia as the Australasian Technical Manager. In 2011, Dr. Paul Bowyer joined Blue H2O Filtration as Group Enologist and Regional Manager SA. Please welcome Paul. Thanks, Robert, and uh, thanks for the invitation to come along and speak today. Hopefully my voice will hold up, and I've been suffering from this cold for the last two weeks, and judging by the coughing and carrying on going in here, I'm not the Lone Ranger, I think. Uh, the presentation I'm going to give here is a, a relatively small subset of a very long presentation, so um, you're being treated in that respect. And uh, a lot of the work that you'll see was done in partnership with, uh, with VINPAC as well, so... Um, uh, Greg Edwards' name is up there. He seems to have a finger in a lot of pies these days. So uh, yeah, credit to uh, to Greg as well. Just a bit of an overview of what a standard sort of filtration looks like. There are variations on this theme, but generally you'll have a depth phase, a, a membrane pre-filter, which is typically a membrane as well, norm normally 0.65 microns, and then the final uh, 0.45 micron housing as well. Uh, there's been some discussion in, in recent years with various people about replacing that depth phase with crossflow, which is possible, but uh, there are some caveats with that, I would say. Um, you do need to be a little bit careful about that uh, for reasons that will become obvious as we, uh, as we go along through the presentation. <coughs> Just for the benefit of those who haven't seen uh, this presentation or parts of it before, a lot of people tend to think about um, a membrane being something like a sheet of paper with 0.45 micron holes punched in it. It's not like that. It's, it's much more like a, a sponge or a piece of bread or something like that. Uh, the, if you look at a membrane sheet from, uh, from on top, so top of the, the page as you can see it there, you would see something like you can see in the left hand image. And if you look at the edge of the membrane, you would see something like the right. Now the image that I've shown there, they're both PES, polyether sulfone which is pretty much these days the, the industry standard for membranes. Ten years ago it used to be nylon, but that's, that's gone the way of the dodo for various reasons um, that I'll touch on briefly here. One thing I'll point out is that a PES membrane is typically asymmetric, which means that the density varies throughout the membrane as you progress through it. The entry and the exit are fairly coarse, and there's a tight region in the middle, which is what provides your, um, your definition for uh, micro-retention and so on. Bear in mind that there is no standard in Australia uh, or New Zealand or pretty much anywhere as far as I'm aware for what constitutes a 0.45 micron wine membrane. There is no standard for that. So that should raise a few eyebrows because most people don't know that. In terms of the two plastics, um, polyether sulfone on the left, nylon on the right. Nylon's been around for nearly 100 years now. Very versatile plastic, but it's not entirely suitable for for usage with wine because it's really good at hydrogen bonding and what that means is that it's good at stripping colour out of young reds in particular. Uh, and these are two membrane discs, that's PES, that's nylon, all I've done is run some young red through those and wash them out with water and I think you can see quite clearly why nylon doesn't feature much in filtration trains these days. <coughs> Alright, so that's, that's the preface onto uh, filterability and, and how it uh, doesn't correlate with uh, NTU or turbidity. Basically the old axiom that a lot of people um, work to, less so these days I think, but some people still work to this, is that if it's less than one NTU it's good to go and you can filter it and we'll have no problems. Um, not necessarily uh, and in certain vintages you have to be more careful than others as will become apparent. NTU just measures light scattering so it gives you an indication of suspended particulates in a wine but not dissolved materials. And dissolved materials are the things that can often cause you more problems because they're just not apparent unless you actually detect them beforehand. Um, so you always have to keep that in mind. And in particular, 
Things like glue cans from a wet vintage can be a big problem. This was a problem in South Australia, particularly in 2011. Um, Manna proteins, tannins, uh, and, a, and a multitudes of other things that can be added to wine uh, in a colloidal form. Glue cans, big problem back in 2011, and that was the, um, the uh, instigation of the work that you're going to see, a lot of what you're going to see here. Uh, effectively, it's a, it's a polysaccharide produced um, by botrytis and uh, it's not removed easily from wine unless you apply a specific enzyme, a gluconase enzyme. Otherwise it just hangs around, it doesn't show up, it might make the wine more difficult to settle, um, but when you find out you've got glucan in your wine if you haven't tested for it previously, which is easy to do, uh, is when it fouls a membrane or even a pre-filter or sometimes even lenticulates if it's really bad. <coughs> Uh, some people think that there's a correlation between turbidity and filterability. This is Greg's data set, so uh, he deserves all the credit for the work that's gone into this one. Definitely not. Uh, you can see here uh, turbidity plotted on the y-axis, filterability on the, on the x-axis, and the data set is pretty um, broadly spread. These are all past samples for filterability. Everything on here is a pass. Uh, we would call that nominally below a value of 20. Uh, and you can see, for example, some samples are, are really exceptional. They're very clean visually and very good from a filterability perspective. No blockage whatsoever down here. <clears throat> and then you've got a guy like this fellow up here that's at 1.5 NTU, yet does not present a filterability problem. So what does that mean? Probably what's causing the high NTU reading there is something that's highly reflective, like tartrate microcrystals or something like that, that's not going to cause a filterability problem. It's not going to block the membrane. Uh, then you have this fellow down here that's less than 0.2 NTU uh, with a borderline filterability index. So visually very clean, good to go? Yeah, maybe, but he's borderline in terms of impact on the membrane. That's the difference between the two measurements, and um, it's worthwhile keeping that in mind. You must distinguish those two. Part of the problem is that uh, a lot of winemakers don't have a lot of understanding of filterability index, and um, in some respects I'll take part of the blame for that because people that used to be lecturers didn't always teach this stuff. Um, packaging is often ignored at universities or even if there's a whole subject on it like there is at uh, Adelaide, it doesn't always touch on things like this. And this uh, can be make or break when it comes to getting a wine from a tank into a bottle uh, without a massive bill attached to it. And I've had that where people have rung me and said, look, can you tell me about filterability because we've just been handed a $15,000 bill from our packager for block membranes. That sort of thing doesn't go down too well. There are various methods uh, used around the world for measuring filterability, and I'll show you a, a couple of them here. One of the main problems with that, and uh, since a lot of you here are lab people, you'll appreciate this, is that somebody's got to stand there and watch the thing, or time it, or move measuring cylinders, or whatever it happens to be, and that's horrible. Nobody likes to do that. Luke talked about the automation and everybody loves that because it removes the, the human factor and you can go off and have a coffee or something like that. Um, there's also variation in the test discs that people use. Often it's whatever's close to hand. Um, what really, filterability is a relative measurement. The test disc should be identical to the membrane that you're running on your packaging line out the back. It's a relative measurement, so, and I'll, I'll show you something to support that in a moment. Um, often you see cellulose acetate used, and in New Zealand they often use cellulose nitrate, which is a flammable goods and really hard to ship around the country. And when you ask them why, they say, oh, I don't know, that's what we were told to use. So that's uh, one to be avoided. But the point is, is that you get variations in responses in filterability analysis according to the membrane test disk that you use. So it's pretty logical, but um, it needs to be mated with the filter that's being used uh, on the packaging line. Uh, another criticism that you get occasionally with filterability analysis, because typically it just takes the wine and puts it straight onto the membrane, is that that's not what happens in packaging. You have the setup that I indicated before, depth filter, 0 0.65, 0 0.45. Uh, no, it doesn't. The point is, is that filterability is just like having a green flag or a red flag. Okay, If you get a pass putting your wine directly onto the membrane, you pretty much know you're going to have no problems at packaging because the pre-filters are going to be doing no work. Okay, If you get a problem, uh, it's, it's not to say you will have a, a problem at packaging, it's to say that you might have a problem. Because if whatever's causing that high filterability index is going to sail through both of those pre-filters and then hit your membrane, then you're going to have a big problem. And that's, that's what it's there to, uh, to avoid. 
So a standard uh, apparatus for measuring is just a pressure vessel with uh, a regulator on it, a sample valve, which you can see down the bottom, and you, a little holder for the, uh, the filterability disc. That's pretty straightforward. You can see these things in many laboratories around the, the country. Um, one thing that uh, I will put forward is that um, I did give this presentation or a similar version of it last year in New Zealand, which is why this is in here. The New Zealand filterability method measures uh, volume for time. So it's based on the, the Rankine method and effectively you have to record volumes passed through the test disc at certain times. That's really messy because you've got to have measuring cylinders and you've got to swap them at certain times. I've watched somebody do this and it's riddled with error. It's absolutely ridiculous to try and get repeatability. Uh, the other thing is, is because it's a ratio, you always get a little number. You always get a really small number unless the sample is very poorly filterable. And it's very hard to draw the line in the sand as what constitutes a pass and a fail when the numbers are all really close together. So for example, at one place over there, they call 1.19 a pass and 1.20 a fail. Now, is that really valid when you see wine splashing all over the bench top as they're trying to measure this? And I've seen this method used at three different sites. Uh, and at one site, they measured the same wine three times in the space of 15 minutes and got three different numbers, completely different numbers. I think it was 1.14, 1.17, and 1.24, something like that. So the repeatability is ridiculous. And, and Luke made a good point of how important that can be. Uh, so it needs to be re reproducible. It needs to be reasonably accurate and, and bulletproof. And uh, the other thing is, is this method, because it works on volume for time, um, you can actually run out of sample, particularly if you're using a PES test disc, because they flow really quickly, about three to four times faster than the old nylon discs. Uh, not sure about the explosive cellulose nitrate ones, but um, uh, you can run out of sample before you complete the analysis. So that's, uh, that's another thing. The one that we advocate is a European method, which is a very, it's another ratio, but in, in this case it's time for a given volume. So time to pass 400 mils minus two times the time to pass 200 mils. So if there's no blockage, you might get 20 seconds to pass 200 mils and 40 seconds to pass 400 mils. In other words, the flux is constant. And when you apply that, you get 40 minus 2 times 20, which is zero. So you have zero blockage, zero filterability index. Good to go. It's, it's very useful as a guide. It's not the be all and end all, but it's a useful guide to how things are gonna go at bottling. It certainly takes into account colloids because you're going through the membrane. Uh, it's pretty reliable. Um, you can't ever run out of wine because it's based on volume. And um, the results uh, need to be taken uh, in conjunction with uh, other data. For example, if your filterability is borderline and you've got a 5,000 litre batch to do and you've got a 10 round membrane housing, it's probably not going to be an issue. But if it's 200,000 litres and it's borderline and you're going through a single membrane cartridge, that would be a problem. So the point is you've got to make it easy. Uh, automation is always great. Um, this is the, the generation three unit of the filterability unit that we had. It's basically the same as the manual unit. So you have a pressure chamber, sample valve, disc holder, and so on, integrated way pan, hooked up to a laptop. Um, these are, these are, are pretty good. Uh, they're not the most robust versions that we've had, and mainly because of the plastic components. You know, they, they get whacked. They, they get a fair hammering at various places. So the one that, um, that we use is a little bit different, I'll show you in a second, but it spits out a report. It calculates um, a couple of filterability indexes, and I'll explain that in a second. It also calculates Vmax, which I would recommend you totally ignore because the extrapolation error is huge, so I never bother with that. So this sample gives you a flux plot, um, so that's your mass over time, nice and straight, which translates to a pretty good filterability index. This is the one that's under testing at Vinpac at the moment. Uh, the unit you can see on the left-hand side, very similar design uh, to the one I showed you previously. It's all stainless, pretty much unkillable, we hope. Easy to clean, those sorts of things. Uh, hopefully it'll tick a few boxes. And Beck assures me she's gonna start playing around with it sooner or later. So has she? Excellent, that's great. All right, uh, this is one from the US that I saw earlier in the year. So this is Roger Bolton's apparatus. It looks ugly, but it's basically the same thing. It's a pressure vessel, it'll have a little spear inside, and you hook up your test discs, which you can see a bunch of down here, onto the end of it, push a sample through, and so on. But um, the technicians did say it's, um, you, you have to start with a water blank, which is what you, know, you should do anyway, but they can spend all day trying to get a, um, a water blank to pass. 
maybe that says something more about the water quality in Petaluma. And looking at these test discs, yeah, I think it's probably pretty ugly right there. All right, so filterability index, they're actually, um, you can extrapolate this as long as you want to, but generally there are two values that I think are quite useful. The standard calculation I've already explained to you is the filter index, which is the one up the top there. But you can actually extend that to 600 grams or 600 mils and get a third data point. So then you've got two, four and 600 mil data points. Uh, the instrument records all of them in between, but so it only uses those ones for the calculations. So this formula is the same as that one. It's just that instead of referencing to to, um, to uh, 200 and going up to 400, you're going up to 600. <clears throat> so it moves the data set along a little bit and expands it. And it's actually the, the uh, comparison of these two indexes that is most useful in, in determining how a wine is going to behave in terms of its filterability. So I think um, it's not a matter, of, there, there is danger in just looking at one number is what I'm getting at. If you just look at one number, you do this calculation uh, you, you can get into trouble uh, for various reasons, but uh, mainly because you can't see what's going on at the slightly longer part of the test. Now, I mentioned before the importance of the, the filtrability test disc being the same as your wine membranes because it is a relative measure. Some people say that's not the case. I can see an argument for that, but um, it doesn't always hold up. It, it works, you could use any test disc pretty much, I think, if the wine is always really clean because the wine is not interacting with the membrane. But 95 times out of 100, that's not the case. There is some level of interaction, some level of blockage, and then you'll see differences between the membranes. So this one's a 2013 Claire Cabernet. Apologies for the ugliness of the, the plot there, but I had to enter this manually. I'm not as good with Greg at mucking around with Excel. Um, but you can see four different plots of mass over time there. It's the same wine. Four different test discs have been used, and you can see they're obviously very, very different responses. So the one on the left is PES, the blue one there, cellulose acetate, the millipore disc is the red one. That's a nylon 0.65, and some places you see people using 0.65 test discs, probably because that's closer to the European standard of a sterile membrane. Um, and then a nylon 0.45. Uh, so you can see the responses between the membranes and the wine are quite different according to the test disc. So it's really important that if you're using a nylon 0.45 brand X, that's what the test disc should be. If you're using a, a PES 0.45 uh, brand Y, that's what your test disc should be. Okay, that's the reason why it has to be that way. And if you calculate the indexes on these, there's a massive spread. Um, this is an example of why the, the, the two numbers can be relevant. So if you're using a PES membrane, you get 17 and 23. They're both around the 20 threshold. Not great, not awful. Uh, the important thing is that, oh, sorry, these two numbers are not massively different, which is great because it indicates there's not much loading up of the membrane, if you like. If you're using cellulose um, acetate, these two numbers are not so much different, but these two are. So you can see that there's considerable loading going on in the latter part of the membrane test. Um, and that's, that's why a comparison of those two numbers is often useful. And the two nylon ones aren't great no matter which way you look at it. So uh, as I said, that's why you don't tend to see so much nylon around. In terms of additives, there are some big influences that you can see uh, with additives on wine membranes. And often these things are dumped into the tanker as it's on the way to the packager. Uh, so that's not great from a stability perspective and, and you get changeable filtrability index um, over the course of hours and days. So that's, that's not great, but it happens. So concentrate's a big one. Um, in this case, it was a 2014 Riesling. It's just an example. This thing had to be packaged. It was required so that in, in this case, the filtrability results were, they said, yeah, it doesn't matter what they are, we're still gonna do it anyway. So that's what happened. The base wine had indexes of eight and 24. And that number being three times that one tells you that there's a bit of curvature coming into the plot up there, which you can see. Not um, This one looks good, this one looks not so good, but it's not awful. As soon as you add concentrate to that, it changes fairly significantly. You can see that the massive impact on the membrane indexes go to 50 and 220. Not great either, but it had to be packaged, so it went down the line. But the interesting thing was this was sampled post-depth phase. So remember the three housings in that diagram. So this was sampled by Greg um, after uh, the depth phase, so the lenticular filters, uh, and that was uh, tested for filterability and it was clean as a whistle. 
So what this means simply is that the, the depth phase was doing its job. It was protecting the filter following, which is 0.65, which is in turn protecting the 0.45. And that's why, that's the way filtration works. It has to be balanced load, and ideally you want the cheaper filters to do the work. In this case, um, it worked out okay. Tannin is another one. Um, Australian winemakers love playing around with tannin. In this case, uh, a red liquid tannin was used, and it was in the 2011 vintage, which, as I mentioned earlier, was quite wet. A lot of botrytis, a lot of lacquers, a lot of loss of colour. So a lot of this stuff was being used. The base wine after it had been cross-flowed was 0.7 NTU, 15 and 9 for filter indexes, so pretty good. As soon as you added a mil per litre of red liquid tannin to put some colour back into it, went up to 5 NTU and of course that's going to fail instantly in a filterability test onto the membrane. So what do you do with this thing then? Well you put it back through the cross-flow, take all the stuff back out again and you end up with a pretty clean wine. If you look at the charts for that, that's the base wine, that's when you add the colour and that's when you take it all back out again. So um, sometimes a little bit of bench testing is a good idea before you go making additions to the tank so you can see what's going to happen in terms of uh, impact on filterability. Flavourings is a new one for me. I hadn't crossed this until last year. <coughs> in this case, um, a flavouring was added to a wine and it was uh, a, uh, what was it? It was a coconut citrus thing, a coconut pineapple, I think it was actually. Um, sounds pretty good. Uh, the, um, the problem was is that it bumped up the NTU to 3. The wine was clean to start with, but adding this flavourant bumped up the NTU. Uh, so then they put it through uh, fairly tight depth filters, lenticulars, and it still came out at 3. And they put it back through again and it came out at 3. And then they put it through a different type of filter and it came out at 3. So why was this thing not being cleaned up by filtration? Uh, and I think and that's the that's the filterability test if you want to see it. It's pretty pretty awful. Um, the uh, I think the simple reason is is that the flavouring had an oily component to it. So the NTU is not generated here by particulate. I think it was an emulsion. So some weird stuff can go on when you muck around with with flavourings. Be be careful of that as well. Cross flow is one thing that I really wanted to get onto fairly well, because it's a big part of the wine industry these days. I've just come back from Austria a few weeks ago and, and it's, you know, there's smaller wineries, the uptake is minimal there. Here it's, it's almost mainstream, so I think it deserves some, some discussion here. Um, this is a, a, a chart from a wine that was put through a cross flow, half of it was bottled straight away, no problems. Uh, no additions, two months later they come back to do the other half and it blocked the membrane really quickly. And so this was again tested at Vinpac. Pretty, pretty awful result, obviously a fail because it just stopped any transmission through the disc after 200 and something mils. Inst uh, importantly, the, the PES disc was really heavily coloured and what that tells you is that it's actually filtering out something that's coloured and it's likely to be, I would guess, a protein tannin complex in this case. Very, very fine. The NTU was still fine, it was still 0.6. It was visually clean, but there's a lot of colloidal material that's accumulated after the cross flow treatment. It wasn't a problem initially, but it was two months later. No further additions to that wine. So uh, this is something to be aware of. Another one, um, another example, 2016 Pinot, a bit over 100 NTU, put through a cross flow, came out at 0.8, but it failed filterability testing for sterile packaging. Um, now this is, you know, you've seen a few examples of this now, so it's not particularly unusual, but why should it fail filterability when it's just come out of a cross flow? which is nominally, typically 0.2 micron membrane filtration. Why, how can that occur? Um, so the, the wine was put back through again, the same cross flow, and it came out a bit cleaner, 0.4, uh, 16 and nine, looks a lot better on the chart. Why did that happen? We didn't realize it at first, but the answer was, uh, which we found out a couple of months later, is that there was uh, a cracked element in the cross flow. Okay, and the way a lot of these cross flows work is the retentate is fed back into the initial wine, so it gets soupier and soupier over time, puts more and more pressure. So if there's a crack or a hole or something like that, it's eventually going to start to bleed through more and more and more, and I'll, I'll show you another example of that. The point that I'm getting at is you can use filterability, this boring bit of equipment sitting in your lab, to keep an eye on your cross flow and make sure it's performing as it should be and spot problems like this. We didn't realise it at the time, but we did afterwards. Um, and uh, just referring back to that, um, that previous slide uh, with the, the two-month separation between bottling, 
what we think is happening is that in the wine you have um, a protein tannin association, so this is particularly reds of course, with a high filtrability index, put it through a cross flow which applies a, applies a pressure of sometimes two, two and a half bar across that membrane, which we think probably shears these sorts of things apart and gives you a better filtrability index. So if you, if you run it through your membrane into bottle pretty quickly, you're probably okay. Uh, but over time, and this can be hours, I have seen hours, these things will come back together and the filtrability index will climb back up. And if you come to it two days later, a week later, two months later, you might have a problem again. So always bear that in mind. Monitoring cross flow performance, I think, is a useful adjunct to this piece of equipment. This was a big, um, big facility, big cross flows, lots of cells, as you can see on the cross flows. We were running a membrane and, and lenticular trial there, and they called us up and said, look, your lenticulars have blocked really quickly. Um, and I said, well, how's your cross flow? So then we went and had a look at the cross flow, and that's what we were doing this for. So if you look at the outputs from the different cells in the cross flow, and these are replicates, this one has three because it was the ugliest one of the lot, you can see that some of these numbers actually don't look too good. And I would suggest that coming out of a, a good, clean, functional cross flow, you should be seeing numbers that are less than five, ideally two and three. Okay? This cell 1A was a big problem in this case. Uh, these were separated in time, as I'll show you in a second, but some of these numbers are downright horrible, and it shouldn't be the case. So this is cell 1A, uh, 959, 1003, 1151. You can see the colour starting to appear as that retentate is fed back into the initial wine going through the, the filter. If you look at the charts, it's very clear. The first one wasn't too bad. A little bit later on, starting to look ugly. And down here, um, an hour or so uh, later, two hours later, it's, it's really ugly. So clearly something wrong there. Um, and that cross flow definitely needed attention. So the, the initial response is always, oh, the filter, your filter's no good. Well, what, what's going on around that filter? That's, that's often the question. So Vinpac have done a lot of analyses. This is a really small subset um, from a presentation of Greg's. You can look at these charts and the beauty, the beauty of them is you can look at them and say, well, that one's good, that one's good, that one's good. These are getting a bit ugly and these ones are horrible. You don't even need to know the numbers. You can look at those things and see exactly what's going on. So just some numbers. Um, basically, what it boils down to is that about 80% uh, of the samples tested were pretty good. Um, some of them uh, not so good and complete fails of the order of 20%. We're talking over 25,000 analyses having been done in the last you know, four years or so. Uh, so 20%, you know, one in five is not great. One in five means you're going to have one in five problems potentially with wines, on average, you know, just as a, as a data set. Um, and so what do you do if a wine fails? Well, you can try putting it back through cross flow. You can just go through depth and not sterile. That's not going to work for most whites and you know, wines with high RS and so on. Or you can hit it with DMDC, but not everybody likes that either. So there are a few options if you get to a fail point. Um, you just have to pick which one's best for you. In terms of Vinpac, um, this was developed, this whole project was initiated by that wet vintage in 2011 and the need to be able to screen for wines that were going to be problems and deal with them ahead of time. So their dollar per litre spend in FY11 um, was sort of a benchmark if you like uh, and uh, that was when we had the wet vintage and so you can see those, those wines fed through for the next couple of vintages as they were blended out to try and get rid of them. They caused problems for a long time. This year was the worst and that was the year of validation of this methodology, publication of articles to let people know what was coming, this sort of thing. Uh, but as soon as it was introduced it started to come back down again and it's decreased ever since. FY16, we need some newer numbers but it's really hard to get numbers out of these guys and they keep telling me, ah, oh, don't worry about it, it's all right. You know, but I do worry about it. Uh, if you just include the last few years on this data set where FI was being used, the, the trend is, is pretty good. It can't go on forever because your filters do cost something, but I expect it, it'll plateau out at some point. The other thing worth knowing is that back in FI11, only 20% of wines were done sterile. Now it's about 80%, so you've got four times as much wine going through membranes as you did back then. And uh, there's also a massive process advantage in that there's a lot of reduced downtime because you don't have unexpected blockages going on uh, on the lines and that just saves you a, a, a heap of money, uh, more so than the, the saving in filters by a big margin. And what we want to see, what Vimpact wants to see, and I think what everybody wants to see, is at the end of the day is a nice straight line 
some really good filter index numbers. And if you want to believe the, the VMAX value, uh, infinite, I don't think so. But uh, that's why you should never trust machines fully. But th we want to see ones like that coming through, not, not nasty ones. We did win an award for this back in 2016 from the uh, Wine Industry uh, Association. Uh, which was great. It's really good to see some validation of your work uh, in the in the sort of uh, industry peer sector, and uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Vimpac for their contribution to that um, to that work as well. Uh, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks.